Today we will introduce what sound is played in auditory brainstem response testing, so-called ABR testing. Let us listen to the sound. The most popular one is click based ABR. It's like d d d d d d d d. Alternatively, 500 hertz based ABR can be played. Or the sound can be a sound hertz. A sound hertz ABR is higher in pitch than 500 hertz, of course. Or even higher, 2,000 hertz. Or highest 4,000 hertz based ABR. So, of course, from 500, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, the pitch goes higher and higher. But all of them can be used for ABR testing. All together, they are called tone burst ABR. So, in short, there are two kinds of ABR. Click ABR versus tone burst ABR. They are used for different purposes. What are those different purposes we will introduce soon? So how to use ABR to test a newborn baby? Before we answer this question, why do we even use ABR for newborn screening? Because there are possibilities a newborn can be deaf or hearing impaired. Um, of course, most of them are normal hearing. So we need to do screen the hearing of a newborn baby. ABR is one of the best choices for us to use. Today's content will cover first statistics, how often we will see abnormal hearing in infants or children. Secondly, developmental and behavior effects of untreated hearing loss in infants. Third one, how does ABR work in general? The fourth section will be our comparison between click-based ABR versus tone-burst-based ABR. The last section, we are going to introduce a little bit more details on different peaks on the ABR response, so-called waves 1 to 5. So National Institutes of Health estimates there are 2 to 3 out of every 1,000 babies born with significant hearing loss. So consequence of undiagnosed loss in infants and children is severe, including language development issue, cognitive development issue, or social development issue. Standard screening includes mostly two kinds. One is called autoacoustic emission, OAE. Second one is today's topic, ABR or auditory brainstem response. They are used to identify hearing loss type and degree. So based on the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Act of 2010, it mandates monitoring statewide programs and systems for screening newborns. And AAP Bright Future Guidelines requires pure tone audiometry at age 3 to age 
eighteen. It is also required to offer more frequent monitoring for children at risk. So why do we need to um, have a, a standardized screening for newborn in regard to hearing loss? This is because there are major developmental and behavioral effects of hearing loss if undiagnosed. Four main areas affected by hearing loss are number one, delaying the development of receptive and expressive communication skills. Secondly, reduced academic achievement due to language deficit. Third, communication difficulty causing social isolation. The fourth one is impact on career choices. So we can see that the impact of hearing loss is severe on communication skills, academic achievements, social isolation, and career choices. Steps for screening newborns. First, milestone is before one month, second, three months, and third one is the follow-up treatment. Test administration and interpretation is typically performed by audiologists. So first step is before one month of age, universal detection of hearing loss is offered. So this is recommended by three organizations, Joint Committee on Infant Hearing, U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, and the National Institute on Deafness and Other Communication Disorders. If there's a abnormal result from the universal detection of hearing loss, then there will be a follow-up in three months. So overall, detection and treatment of hearing loss at birth reported to save $400,000 in special education costs by time child enters school. How does ABR work? So ABR can be done during baby sleep. The ABR test is safe and does not hurt. It is also year specific, which means we will test the left ear to get the ABR response, and we will test the right ear to get another response. So uh, we can see that a sound is played to the ear of a newborn, and a response will form is recorded on the head. As you can see, here is a recording point. And we play sound to the baby and we record the brain activity on the head. Of course, we have more than one point of recording. The result is shown here. The x-axis time, the y-axis is amplitude. In the waveform, Roman in number is the index of peaks. The seven peaks are called wave one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So each peak represents a neural firing from one specific area within the brainstem or auditory nerve. So auditory nerve is the eighth nerve, and this is a normal ABR. Okay. So wave one and two are generally predominant from the action potential on the absent lateral side. I introduce what is absolute lateral side later. So wave three to five are generated from the complex interaction of both the contralateral side and ipsilateral side. What is ipsilateral? What is contralateral? So we have two ears and we have two auditory cortex, left auditory cortex and right auditory cortex. So we have two inner ear. In the inner ear, we have two cochlear, left 
and the right. And we have auditory nerves, left and right. So if a sound is played to the left ear, so there will be response on both same side, and there will be response on the opposite side. Any response along the pathway on the same side is called ipsilateral. So in short, waves 1 and 2 are mostly generated on the same side of the sound stimulation. On the other hand, waves 3 to 5 are generated by both sides which means both the contralateral side and ipsilateral side. It's a summation of both sides and there are also interaction between both sides. So that's the difference. As you can see on this picture, the first two waves and the wave 3 to wave 5 are separated by circles. Okay, that's the reason why we separate them, because they come from different source. Then what will happen in the ABR testing? First of all, as we mentioned, three to four small stickers, so-called electrodes, will be placed on your child's head in front of his or her ears. They are also connected to a computer. A song is played through the earphones. And the electrode measure how your child brain actively respond to it. And your baby is in sleep. So you don't have to do anything or say anything. The audiologist doing the test will see that on the computer. So what does ABR tell us? ABR is a neurological test of auditory brainstem function in response to auditory stimuli. Auditory stimuli are the sounds we play. The ABR testing tells us how the middle ear, the inner ear, the inner ear is called cochlea, to the auditory brainstem are working. So remember we mentioned middle ear, inner ear, and auditory brainstem. So each of them is a different components on the auditory pathway toward the auditory cortex. Then when do we ask for a ABR testing? Uh, ABR testing is often ordered if a newborn fails the hearing screening given in hospital shortly after birth, or for older children if there's a suspicion of hearing loss that was not confirmed through more conventional hearing tests. How do we explain the results of ABR testing? So we can look at the ABR results from different uh, angles. First of all, we can look at the amplitude. So a normal hearing baby, his or her BR result, the amplitude of the result is within certain range. Why would we need to look at the wave amplitude? For example, why do we need to look at the amplitude of wave 5? How far or how high the amplitude is after the onset of the sound? Here is the onset of sound. So after this much time, how high amplitude will jump? because that indicates the number of neuron firing. For normal hearing, maybe we want to see enough number of uh, neuron firing when we give the sound to the ears of the, uh, the baby. Secondly, we need to observe latency of the wave because the latency is the duration between the onset of the sound until the showing up of the wave or the peak. 
And we need to see how much is the time between the two. This latency is important because it indicates the speed of transmission of information in our brain. For a normal hearing baby, the latency should be within a certain range. Thirdly, we need to investigate inter-peak latency because it shows the time between peaks. Again, between peak 3 or wave 3 versus wave 5, the delay is a reasonable value within a certain range. We need to check that. Fourth one is interoral latency, which means, as we mentioned, the same side versus opposite side. We have two auditory pathways. They both will respond to the sound. We need to investigate the latency difference between two responses because that will show the difference between two years. The fifth one is auditory sensitivity. It can estimate frequency-specific hearing loss. Last one, ABR can also offer other diagnostic information. For example, demyelinating disorders can be diagnosed through ABR testing. What do we mean by estimated frequency specific hearing loss? That means we can offer more information in regard to frequency versus fre fre hearing loss. For example, we can see how much is the hearing loss on 500 Hz. How much is hearing loss on 1000 Hz, so on and so forth. In summary, we mentioned that we have different uh, sounds we can play in ABR testing. And we mentioned that we can play 500, 1000, 2000, 4000 different uh, tone bursts. If we use these, we can tell frequency-specific hearing loss okay, by using tone burst ABR, not click ABR. Click ABR can offer other benefits, other five benefits. Okay. Then how to measure latency? Right? If we, if we uh, see a, a picture, like the, the picture on the right, how do we uh, measure latency? So it's uh, quite straightforward. The peak latency of wave one and three are measured at their highest peak. So which means for wave one, that's the duration between onset of sound and the point of the peak of the first uh, wave. Similarly, we can measure the latency of the third wave. For wave 5, it's a bit different because uh, sometimes wave 4 and wave 5 are mingled, sometimes they are not. So if there is a clearly recognized wave 4, the peak latency of wave 5 is measured at the highest peak. Otherwise, if wave 4 and wave 5 are mingled as a one complex, then the latency of wave 5 is measured at the farthest excursion before the chow of the complex, so which is here, right, if they are mingled, right here. So we can measure latency from the onset of sound to this point. Okay. So for example, this can be 7 millisecond or 8 millisecond. That's normal range of wave 5. So which wave is most critical? The latency of wave 5 is most critical. Why? Because uh, since ABR was found in 1970s, much emphasis has been 
placed on the latency of V5 to study hearing loss and uh, speech disorders. So, in short, um, V5 has been studied widely, and uh, V5 is also the highest and most obvious wave on this chart. So that's why it's being uh, used uh, the marker across all clinics. So let's talk about normal versus abnormal. So first, the metric we want to talk about is latency. What is normal latency? What is not? So as we just mentioned, for a normal hearing baby, the latency of wave five should be around seven to nine milliseconds. Well. For a hearing impaired baby, uh, very likely we, we could see a uh, much longer latency than normal. Secondly, we want to look at a metric called amplitude, how high the ABR will jump. On the particular point of wave 5, uh, what is normal, what is not? So typically, the normal amplitude of wave 5 is between 0 0.1 to 1 uh, microvolt. Uh, if the amplitude of wave 5 is less than 0 0.04 microvolts, then it's not present. If wave 5 is not present in the ABR of one year, that's a serious issue. What's wrong? Before we introduce what's wrong, Let's first define a term called a threshold. What is a threshold? The lowest intensity level of sound that makes wave 5 become present is called the threshold. In other words, the threshold is a minimal sound level that can make the wave 5 show up. The unit of a threshold is dBNHL, or decibel normalized hearing level, like 20 dBNHL, 30, or 40. The higher your threshold, the worse is the degree of hearing loss. So we can see that the degree of hearing loss can be determined by the ABR testing. How it can do that. It can do that through the threshold. The higher the threshold, the worse is the hearing. So for normal hearing baby, the threshold is less than 20 dBHL. Any threshold above 20 dBHL, there is a hearing loss. Like 30, 40, 50, those are numbers for hearing impaired baby. 50 is worse than 40, 40 is worse than 30. And nature of hearing loss, whether the problem happens on the middle ear, or inner ear, or auditory nerve, or brainstem, where the problem of hearing happens can be also determined by ABR testing. How? This is how. We, in clinic, in practice, we can use either air conduction ABR, basically you play a sound via earphones, or we can use bone conduction ABR. That means we play a sound via oscillator on the bones behind the ear, like this. This is bone conduction ABR. So there are two types of ABR testing in regard to how the sound is delivered, either air conduction or bone conduction. So latency information and the results for a bone conduction ABR can provide insight to the nature of hearing loss. For example, if there is a prolonged wave 5 latency, which means a longer wave 5 latency. But interwave latency means the time between wave 3 and wave 5 are within normal limits. 
the two pieces of information together is indicative of a conductive hearing loss. What is a conductive hearing loss? It's essentially a middle ear dysfunction. So what is a middle ear dysfunction? Let's go back to the, uh, the structure of outer, middle, and inner ears. So outer ear, including pinna, ear canal, all the way to the eardrum here. So that's the range of uh, outer ear. The middle ear goes from the uh, eardrum before entering the cochlea. So in middle ear, there are three tiny bones called uh, slips, malus, and incus. If any problem on any of the bones, there will be a con conductive hearing loss. That means the sound is not properly conducted from outer ear to inner ear. So inner ear also very critical. The cochlea also uh, called as uh, the organ of cordy is converting the movement of the bones to the firing of neurons on auditory nerves. So of course we have other components along the auditory pathway, for example, uh, auditory brainstem, and auditory cortex, so on and so forth. Based on this structure, we can understand what is a, a contact hearing loss. So our middle ear system can offer a natural boost about uh, 6 dB to help overcome impedance mismatch. What is impedance mismatch? Because uh, it, the middle ear converts the sound waves from the air transmission to the fluid field in the ear. However, the, uh, the inner ear or the cochlea is not acoustic friendly environment. So we need a boost of the inner ear. We need a small bones to amplify sound before it enters in the ear. So that's why we say the middle ear provides a boost intensity to transfer sound from air to fluid. If we have a middle ear dysfunction, for example, the auscular chain fusion, surely it reduces the efficiency of this boosting. Or we can say the baby may have difficulty in hearing. So that's called a conductive hearing loss. So let's go back to the, the nature of hearing loss. The nature of hearing loss can be determined by ABR testing. So we mentioned one kind that's uh, conductive hearing loss, essentially uh, one kind of uh, middle ear dysfunction. And there are uh, uh, another type called the sensor neural hearing loss. That's essentially inner ear damage or the damage of cochlea. We mentioned that uh, there are two uh, types of uh, sound we can play in ABR. One is click, one is tone burst. So this tone burst ABR can be used for detect uh, sensory neural loss. And click ABR often used to detect conductive hearing loss. Of course, we could use uh, click ABR in uh, first time detection of uh, sensory hearing loss. But to offer frequency-specific values or information, we need uh, to use uh, tone burst ABR. Okay. So, tone burst ABR offers uh, more insight into the configuration of the hearing loss. Like is the hearing loss on is that more severe on 500 hertz or more severe on 2,000 hertz or more severe on 4,000 hertz? We can tell by looking at the uh, 
one of the ABR, right? Because we need to do four times. Then we can compare the result between 500 versus 1,000 versus 2,000 versus 4,000 hertz. So if there is a sensor neural hang loss in a year of a baby, uh, what do we will observe? We will observe on the ABR result normal absolute wave and the interwave latencies at high intensity, which means if we play the sound at a very high volume, you, we can see normal absolute wave latency, like wave 5, it is still within 7 to 9 millisecond. And plus, we can see the interwave latency, for example, the latency between wave 3 and wave 5 are still within normal range. However, we need to play the sound very loud. And so that cause, that cause uh, elevated wave 5 threshold. That's an indicator if you combine first and the second, the two components in the observation of ABR result. We will come to the conclusion of the sensory neural hearing loss, not the con conductive hearing loss. So in summary, by looking at ABR results, we can not just tell there is a hearing loss, but also tell the nature of hearing loss. Let's review what we have played before we proceed to next chapter. So first is click ABR. It's a broadband. It's not frequency specific. It's the most popular one. Secondly, let's play 500 Hz ABR. Thirdly, we play 1000 Hz ABR. Then 2000 Hz. and uh, 4,000 Hz. So as we mentioned, uh, the two kinds are used for different purposes, like we just introduced. Click ABR can be used for detecting the uh, conductive hearing loss. Tone burst ABR can be used for uh, sensory neural hearing loss detection. And uh, they can compensate for each other. And, uh, um, and also, the reason we can use uh, different tones, like 500 hertz to 4,000 hertz, is because uh, um, cochlear uh, can have different damages at different places. Some area uh, uh, is responsible for 500 hertz um, detection. Some area are for other frequencies or tones. So that's why we can kind of uh, locate uh, where it could be damaged. That can also help us to classify the sensory neural hearing loss to different uh, subcategories. So that can help uh, um, both uh, neurologists and other doctors to um, uh, dive deeper into the situation of the hearing of the newborn. So we talk about um, hearing loss. Uh, then let's, uh, is there any other disease that can be um, detected through the ABR testing? Yes. One example is auditory neuropathy or auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. Auditory neuropathy can be confirmed or ruled out by looking at the polarity effect of the wave. The polarity defects on the wave, what does that mean? So when we change the polarity of the click sound from a uh, Refraction click to a condensation click, the ABR form has no inversion or inversion. If the ABR waveform has no inversion, then that's a normal. If there is an inversion, that is uh, telling us the baby probably has auditory uh, neuropathy spectrum disorder. And uh, other examples include uh, 
brings them this function. For example, if we see uh, wave one is present, but wave two to wave five are not present. So that's an indicator of brainstem dysfunction. What is present and what is not present we introduced earlier. Uh, for example, there's the range of the amplitude between, for example, for wave 5, it is the normal means between 0 0.1 uh, microvolt to 1 microvolt. That's considered normal. If it's below, for wave 5, if it's below 0 0.04, that means it is uh, not present, it's too small. 0 0.04 microvolt, okay? So that a definition between present versus not present. So the recommendation of ABR testing will be a follow-up visit, means sometime later, come back, or refer to our specialists like a neurologist, or the result of the recommendation could be offering a hearing aid for amplification of sound. Or even further, an uh, implant, a cochlear implant, or a brainstem implant. Those are different recommendations from ABR testing. So pros and cons of ABR testing. So ABR is an objective test because it provides estimation of hearing sensitivity for patients who are unable to give reliable subjective information. Ideally for um, an adult, right, we can ask after we play a sound, do you hear a sound? Then we can tune down the volume of the sound until the patient cannot hear any sound so that no, okay, this is a minimal sound level you can hear. That's how we detect a, the threshold for a normal adult or normal patient. But for some patients, that's just uh, not possible, including infants. So infants and young children, and also difficult to test the older children, or even some adults, right? For some reason, they cannot be tested by asking. So no way to test uh, subjectively. In this scenario, ABR is a good tool to test. But ABR is not a direct test of hearing because hearing includes all the way from the ear, outer ear, in middle ear, inner ear, vertebrae, brainstem, and uh, all the way to the vertebrae cortex. Only if we hear sound that can prove the whole chain, all the components on the audio pathway are working. Here, ABI is not testing all the pathway. It only tests until brainstem. So that's why it's not a direct testing of hearing. It is a test of a synchronous neural function, which is a great indicator of testing hearing. So it can be used to estimate hearing sensitivity. We talk about the click versus tone burst ABR. How do we choose one versus another? Let's compare them briefly. A click based ABR or in clinic we call the click invoked, click evoked ABR. It's the most basic and most popular and it's broadband, it covers many frequencies, so not frequency specific. It's more efficient because of the construction. And when we play a click uh, uh, based uh, ABR, we can get a, a very classic waveform morphology, right? The, the waveform we just showed earlier is a very classic waveform morphology, so easy to identify, easy to tell. However, if we play tone bursts, um, we get more information in regard to frequency. Right? Uh, for example, we mentioned how do we 
cloud uh, frequency specific hearing loss. We can do that. Uh, along with we repeat the ABR testing with different stimuli, right? From 500 to 4000 hertz. But we, we need to notice that uh, by nature, tone bursts ABR, we will observe longer latency, right? So be careful not using click based uh, uh, ABR um, values to compare, right? For, for sure, we will see longer latency. So let's look more closely into wave one to wave five. So where they are coming from in our brain. So they are five primary ABR components, important. And wave one is initially at the peripheral or distal portion of a cranial nerve eight. It should occur at approximately 1.5 millisecond after the onset of the click. Wave two is sort of originated from the more proximal portion of that nerve. Which nerve? The cranial nerve eight. So it will arrive about 2.5 millisecond after the onset of click, one millisecond later. Wave 3 is generated at the level of the cochlear nucleus, should occur at approximately 3.5 milliseconds, which means when we record it, it's 1 millisecond later than wave 2. Wave 4 is generated at the, in the region of the superior olive complex, lateral or laminiscus, at about 4.5 milliseconds. That's again 1 millisecond later. Finally, the most important one, wave 5, is generated at the region of the lateral or uh, nemeniscus, inferior or uh, co colicus, around 5.5 millisecond. So that's all for today's introduction. If you have any question or any thought, feel free to contact me. If you like the video, please subscribe and we can talk later. Bye bye.